Uh, if Abraham had a cell phone with a voice memo app, he could have pressed the button and recorded the voice of God. And then it would have been potentially acceptable as scientific evidence. <laughs> but he didn't have a voice memo app, unfortunately. <laughs> unfortunately, he <laughs> so, didn't have. <laughs> so my point is, uh, it really requires scientists to get engaged. Now... Welcome to Star Views. Um, I'm here today with Mauro Biglino and Professor Avi Loeb. Um, the last time that I interviewed Avi Loeb on this channel, I ended the interview with uh, a quote from, from his book that I would like to recall today, by heart actually, I go. Uh, and he goes like, um, we should not forget about uh, Galileo's time when the theologians and the philosophers, they refused to even look through the telescopes. Um, so today we are here with two scholars with different uh, field of study, different background, different stories, but one thing in common, because they never refuse to look through the telescopes of their own discipline. So it's a pleasure to be here with uh, uh, Avi Loeb and Mauro Biglino. And let me start with a short introduction of both. Uh, Mauro Biglino is a best-selling author with uh, Italian publishing house Mondadori. He has published many books, but I would like just to remember, recall two here. Um, La Bibbia non parla di Dio, uh, The Bible Does Not Talk About God, and Il Falso Testamento, The False Testament. Before working uh, for Mondadori, Mauro Biglino has been working for a decade with Edizioni San Paolo. And Edizioni San Paolo uh, is one of the uh, biggest Italian publishing houses in religion. And he was translating the interlinear uh, Hebrew Bible. Um, so he translated 19 books of the Old Testament. Uh, only 17 of these books were um, published because at a certain point, uh, Mauro started to air his own doubts and questions, and let's say what it is like he was censored for his opinions. Um, so it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to, to be here with uh, Mauro. Mauro, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you to you for the Professor, introduction. Thanks. Uh, Professor Loeb um, was the uh, chair of the astronomy department at Harvard University for nine years until 2020. He also chairs uh, many institutions, including the Black Hole Initiative, also at Harvard University, the Starshot Initiative, which uh, aims at sending um, light sail probes to Proxima Centauri, the, the closest stars um, outside the solar system. Um, in 2012, Time Magazine uh, selected Avi Loeb as one of the 25 most influential uh, people in, in space. He is also author of uh, several uh, hundreds of uh, scientific articles eight books and is the best-selling author of Extraterrestrial, the first sign of uh, intelligent life beyond Earth, which is also going to be published in Italian, correct, Professor, in uh, 2022. So Italian leadership, be ready for this new exciting publication by Professor Avi Loeb. Thank you very much for your time today. Thanks for hosting me. And I guess we could have spoken Hebrew because Mauro is able to read. Uh... <coughs> The Old Testament. But I, I wouldn't be able to participate <laughs> at this point. <laughs> Anyways, um, so let's start from the very beginning, Professor, because uh, let's talk about extraterrestrial um, and Oumuamua, since it's going to be published. What uh, are we going to find in this book uh, uh, as Italian readers in, uh, soon? Yes, so the book uh, focuses on the first object that was discovered near Earth that came from outside the solar system. Uh, it was found in 2017 uh, by a telescope in Hawaii called Pan Stars, and uh, given the name Oumuamua, which means a scout in the Hawaiian language. And uh, the simplest uh, assumption to make is that it was a rock that uh, came from another star. And in fact, that's what the astronomy community first thought. But then it didn't look like the objects we have seen within the solar system. It didn't look like a comet. It didn't have gas or dust around it. It had a very extreme shape based on the fact that it, every eight hours it tumbled and the amount of light reflected from it changed by a factor of 10. 
And moreover, it exhibited a push away from the sun that you don't expect for an asteroid. So it was not a comet and not an asteroid, and it was something else. And I suggested that it may be artificial in origin, and I go into all the details of why in the book, Extraterrestrial. But I also discuss um, something else, which is that the scientific community uh, is very reluctant to talk about uh, evidence for extraterrestrial uh, intelligent life. And uh, uh, it really uh, uh, is uh, quite unfortunate because the subject appeals uh, to the public, the public funds science. And the scientific community right now is engaged in very speculative ideas that they will not be tested empirically in our lifetime, such as um, the multiverse or extra dimensions or the string theory landscape. So it's not as if the mainstream in theoretical physics is simply conservative. There is something else going on. And I think it's the lack of uh, paying attention to evidence when it's uh, not in, uh, either when it's not in agreement with what we expected or if it's not available, it's even more convenient because then you can do mathematical gymnastics and demonstrate that you are smart. And um, I talked about the, the culture in the scientific community. I talked about the implications of finding that we are not the smartest kid on the block. And the, all of this uh, sort of boiled to a new project that we announced just uh, uh, less than a week ago. And we can talk about it. It's called the Galileo Project because I can see the parallel between my experience where I have a lot of pushback, a lot of uh, negative remarks and uh, personal remarks uh, by scientists on Twitter. Fortunately, I don't have an account on Twitter, so I, I, I don't really care how many likes I have. Uh, but um, if uh, Galileo was alive today, he would have been canceled on social media. That's obvious. And at the time, uh, the philosophers refused to look through his telescope. And I would think that we would have learned a lesson. But I can tell you that there was an article by a philosopher in Nature Astronomy magazine just a few weeks ago, arguing that Oumuamua is not a technological relic based on philosophical arguments. And I asked myself, haven't we learned something? <laughs> thank you, thank, thank you for the introduction, Professor Loeb. Um, Mauro, uh, in addition to this book from Professor Loeb, there were also uh, many public personalities that came forward, including Barack Obama talking about UAP, uh, UFOs, and so on, members of the Senate. And also there was this report from the Pentagon. Um, uh, uh, what do you think of this report of the Pentagon? Do you think is a disappointment or maybe is a turning point? Ma io penso sia veramente un turning point perché rappresenta la chiusura di un'era e l'apertura di un'altra era. Prego. I I really believe that it's a a turning point. It's the end of one era and marks the beginning of a new one. È finito il periodo delle domande alle quali venivano date delle risposte troppo facili e molto spesso anche ironiche. It's, we've come to the end of a time when answers to these kinds of questions were a little bit too easy and sometimes even ironic. Le domande precedenti erano naturalmente esistono, non esistono, sono delle fantasie, sono delle invenzioni. The, the, the questions were more like, do, do they exist? Do they not exist? Are they pure imagination, fantasy? Adesso le domande inevitabili, per fortuna, sono, dato il fatto che esistono, che cosa sono? Da dove vengono? Chi le ha fatte? Chi le ha ideate? So now the questions are more, okay, they exist. <laughs> so now we want to know, what are they? Where do they come from? Who made them? Cioè, il riconoscimento della esistenza di questi UAP è veramente un fatto storico e per quanto riguarda il mio lavoro ha una valenza straordinaria. As far as I'm concerned, the very fact that there is such a report on this marks a real turning point and as far as my work in particular is concerned, uh, it, it's an extraordinary event. Perché 
Queste domande nuove che eh, ho detto sono riferibili non soltanto al presente, così come appunto ci ha ben evidenziato il professore, ma per quanto mi riguarda sono a questo punto applicabili al passato, visto che, ma poi magari avremo modo di parlarne in seguito, i popoli di tutta la terra ci hanno parlato di certi fenomeni. In, in fact, what's really interesting is it's not just that these questions are applicable to uh, things that are taking place right now, but also applicable to things from the past. And in fact, we'll have an opportunity to talk more about it in a few moments, but that all the peoples of the earth historically have spoken about things that appear to be these UAPs. Uh, Professor Loeb, uh, picking up from where Mauro Biglino uh, left, uh, maybe this Galileo's project aims at uh, answering some of these questions that he numbered. Right. So, well, what is uh, this about? So uh, after the UAP report came out, um, uh, the head of NASA, Bill Nelson, um, said that scientists should get engaged. And of course, that resonated with me. I approached people under him and I said, I'll be glad to help you make your boss happy, uh, but they didn't report, uh, get back to me. And a week later, uh, I received a note from the administrator of the astronomy department at Harvard saying, you have a new research fund. And in academia, that never happens. So I asked, where is the money from? Could you please explain? Uh, and she said it was a donor. And I said, okay, well, I would like to thank this donor. It's an elementary request of a professor getting money to know who gave the money so that I can thank that person. And they took a day before they got back to me. And then another person, a multi-billionaire came to the porch of my home and uh, with questions about my book. And uh, was very excited and said that he would like to contribute as well. And within two weeks, I got uh, $1.75 million. And I said, okay, now I don't need to ask anyone. Uh, I can just do it. And uh, the point is, it's not a philosophical question. It's just a question of getting a high resolution image of these objects, meaning a megapixel image. And I wrote a Scientific American article uh, saying, if you take a one meter telescope and you look at a, an object that is roughly the size of a person at a distance of a kilometer, you will be able to resolve a millimeter scale feature, roughly the size of the head of a pin. You can easily read off the label made on planet X. So it's just getting that image, megapixel image, rather than using all these cell phones that have a millimeter scale uh, aperture camera that will always give you a fuzzy image. You know, one big telescope is worth a thousand cell phones. It's not worth it to take pictures with cell phones. It will always be fuzzy. That's the rules of optics. So I decided to assemble a team of uh, scientists, uh, mostly astronomers. And by now we have about 50 people. Uh, on the research team, we have about a dozen. Uh, and um, what we are planning to do is uh, buy off the shelf uh, telescopes, cameras, and the data will flow into computer systems. And then we will analyze and filter the objects of interest and track them. And there is a second component to the Galileo project, and it's obvious why we called it Galileo. Okay. Um, the second component is to look at interstellar objects like Oumuamua and uh, find them before they approach Earth and then send uh, a spacecraft equipped with a camera so that it will take a close-up photograph. Again, I would like to emphasize, a picture is worth a thousand words. That's what's usually said. In my case, a picture is worth 66,000 words, the number of words in my book. Uh, indeed, we live in very interesting times. First, we had this Pentagon coming out with this report, and then, you know, a public personality speaking up, and then there is this uh, amazing project uh, led by Professor Loeb. So um, the present is very exciting. Although uh, UFO is hardly something new, Mauro, maybe I will ask you to give us a little bit of historical perspective on it, UAP and UFOs. Sì, in effetti, io penso che il progetto Galileo del professore 
abbia la possibilità e spero veramente che raggiunga i risultati ovviamente per lui e per l'importanza di questo progetto prego uh, I believe that in fact the work that Professor Loeb is doing is incredibly important and I, I wish you all the luck in, in getting verifiable results that we can actually study perché io ritengo che eh, raggiungendo certi risultati But I believe that reaching certain results si arrivi a dare luce al nostro passato, anche al nostro passato. That this is going to give us, a shed a lot of light even on our past. E per me questo è fondamentale. Perché? Perché i popoli di tutti i continenti della Terra ci hanno lasciato delle documentazioni scritte o anche delle immagini Uh, because in fact this is fundamental because all the peoples of the earth have left us documentation even images riferibile ai cosiddetti UAP uh, things that seem to be referring to these so-called UAPs e quindi la cosa interessante è che ora siamo in un periodo in cui diventa lecito po anzi doveroso porsi queste domande perché è difficile pensare che su tutto il pianeta Terra tutti abbiano inventato nel passato le stesse cose. But this is a fundamental for what's happening now, that we are able to um, rightfully and, and legitimately ask these questions, because it, it seems unthinkable that all these various peoples from across history, from across the earth, all came up with the same images and references at the same time and in the same ways. Al di là di tutti gli studiosi che si occupano di questo aspetto relativi al passato, mi ha fatto molto piacere ascoltare un appartenente al congresso americano, un repubblicano. It was particularly interesting for me to hear, uh, in the light of all of these things, a member of the American Congress, a Republican in fact, dire che la Bibbia di questi UAP è strapiena. That, in fact, the Bible uh, is full of references to UAPs. E se noi leggiamo la Bibbia con mente aperta, non possiamo riconoscere che è assolutamente vero. Dopodiché, coloro che non amano queste cose hanno il dovere di dare una dimostrazione diversa. Uh... In fact, we, we have to approach this now with uh, an open mind and those who don't like the results of Camera, that it's, the onus is now on them to provide us with another demonstration. Quindi la visione telescopica nel passato è estremamente affascinante. So especially as applied to uh, the questions of the past, this is really exceptional and very important. D'altra parte il professore ci insegna che guardando lontano nello spazio in realtà noi stiamo guardando nel passato e quindi in tra l'altro le due cose. In fact exactly as the professor is, is teaching us as we look further into space in fact what we're looking at is our own past. Uh, yeah I should um, also add to that we are looking also at our future because um, <laughs> if, if it was um, another civilization that predated us. You know, most of the stars formed billions of years before the sun. So just imagine just one technological civilization that existed somewhere else that was more advanced than we are. They could have uh, developed artificial intelligence systems like we have. And uh, we already have self-driving cars and imagine AI systems 10 years from now or 100 years from now and sending them to space. And they, they are just like kids that you educate at a young age you, um, through machine learning. You give them the guiding principles for how to approach the world. And then you can send them into space. And there is no need for any guidance uh, from whoever sent them because it takes a long time, even for light to travel between stars. So uh, the point is these probes uh, are equipped with artificial intelligence and perhaps uh, Uh, 3D printers that allows them to replicate themselves, they could have sent a billion years ago and they could have been on all habitable planets in the Milky Way galaxy during that time. And uh, we should not assume anything. So in a way, if we meet 
a, a technological piece of equipment, it would represent what we might achieve in our future. It would be something for the future. Uh, but uh, as uh, Mauro already said, it could have arrived here already in the past uh, for us. But uh, technologically, it's something that uh, it would take us a long time to develop ourselves. And it's sort of a learning experience because we can learn a lot from it. Uh, we might need our own AI systems to interpret their AI systems, just like we ask kids to help us understand what we find on the internet because they're more computer savvy. So uh, it would be an interesting dialogue, so to speak. But first thing is to find these objects. And you know, some of the reports that came may have mundane explanations. All you need is one object. You don't need more than one. Even if 99% of the objects that were talked about are not real, uh, you know, or are natural in origin, that is irrelevant. If one of them is an extraterrestrial uh, technology, that would have a huge impact. Speaking about this, Professor, I uh, let's talk a little bit about met methodology here and, and, and sources and data. Because Mauro Bellino gave us an historical perspective telling us that UFO is hardly a new thing for humankind and blah, blah, blah. But I guess with this Galileo's project, you are looking for a specific set of data. What what are you what are you uh, what do you expect to collect? Can you tell us something about this? Yeah, so it's just like a fishing expedition, meaning you throw the hook, and you don't know what kind of fish you will find. Now, if we see a bird, we say that's not interesting. If we see an airplane, not interesting. If it's a drone, also not interesting. If it's something that has a label made in China, not interesting. For me, it's completely boring. For the national security people, it's amazingly interesting. <laughs> That's what they want to do for a living. I don't care about made in China things. I really don't care. Uh, so if you basically exclude all of these and you also exclude some atmospheric effect because that could also happen in the atmosphere. You can have a lightning, you can have some, you can have a meteor coming in. If you exclude these natural objects or, or effects, whatever remains is of great interest to me, okay? <laughs> so I don't want to say what fish I will find. I just I want see. to say what, what fish I don't want to get. I don't care about fish that have made in China on them, fish that have, that look like, you know, objects that humans make. Uh, Mauro, let's talk a little bit about your methodology um, because you, you often say uh, metaphorically that we should undress the Bible uh, to, in order to remove 2,000 plus years of you know, um, dressing up the Old Testament of all sorts of science, um, theological superstructures and, and whatnot. Uh, so what, what does it mean? What, what is your methodology? How do you read the Bible? Io penso che quando si parla al pubblico si abbia il dovere di essere onesti e chiari. I think when talking with the public we have uh, the responsibility to be direct and clear. Così il pubblico ha la possibilità di scegliere se ascoltare ciò che dici oppure no. And that way the people themselves can decide whether they're going to pay any attention to what we're saying, whether they want to listen to us or not. Così io dal 2010 ho dichiarato espressamente il mio metodo. So since uh, 2010 I've been quite clear about my method. Che consiste in questo. Assumere per vero ciò che è scritto nei testi antichi. First of all it starts with the idea that I assume that what is written is true. Ciò che è scritto letteralmente perché i miei contratti con la casa editrice cattolica prevedevano che io traducessi letteralmente l'ebraico masoretico. In fact, that's what I was expected to do by the publishing house I was working with, that I translate directly and literally exactly what was written in the Old Testament. Pertanto io ho sempre detto al pubblico e continuo a ripetere, io non so se è vero ciò che hanno scritto, ma ciò che hanno scritto è questo. So my approach to it has been very specific, very consistent. I said it then and I continue to say it now. I don't know if what they wrote is true or not, but this is what they wrote. Ed è questo che mi interessa che le persone sappiano. Ed è per questo 
finisco, che cerco di spogliare la Bibbia di tutto ciò che le è stato messo sopra per coprirla. So what I've tried to do is take apart everything that has been dressed up on top of it so that I can reveal what was actually written. E il mio metodo poi ovviamente consiste nello stare attento non soltanto al significato della singola parola. So my method is paying attention not just to what the, the meaning of each single word is, ma all'intero contesto nel quale quella parola è inserita. But in the entire context in which that word has been placed. E poi comparare ciò che c'è scritto nella Bibbia con ciò che c'è scritto negli antichi testi di altre importanti e antiche religioni. And then to make uh, a work of comparison between what is written in what we call the Old Testament and what is written in other ancient texts from other cultures. Ed è di qui che vengono fuori le, non le chiamo scoperte perché io non ho scoperto nulla, vengono fuori le informazioni veramente più interessanti. And this is exactly where we find this really interesting information. I won't call them discoveries because I didn't discover them. They're there. That's the information that we find most interesting in that work of comparison. Questo è il mio metodo. This is my method. Uh, this is a method uh, that created a lot of problems to Mauro Biglino. <laughs> but, but talking about the scientific community, can I, before we get to the community, yes, yes. comment on that method? Um, so, you know, in the courtroom, um, eyewitness testimonies that are corroborating can put a person in jail. That's acceptable. In science, uh, what people say is irrelevant. You can't write a scientific paper saying, that person told me that or wrote that. That's not enough evidence. You need to collect evidence with instruments. So, for example, the biblical story of Abraham, uh, that heard the voice of God telling him to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. Uh, if Abraham had a cell phone with a voice memo app, he could have pressed the button and recorded the voice of God. And then it would have been potentially acceptable as scientific evidence. <laughs> but he didn't have a voice memo app, unfortunately. <laughs> unfortunately, he <laughs> didn't have. <laughs> so my point is... Uh, it really requires scientists to get engaged. Now, in the past, scientists ridiculed this subject. I'm trying to change that. And I get ridiculed. I get uh, a lot of things said about me. I, you know, maybe even worse than Mauro uh, heard about himself. The point is, I don't really care because I keep my eyes on the ball, not on the audience, you know, as they say in basketball. You know, you right. keep your eyes on the ball. and. Uh, in that's, that's what I told my research team. I said, uh, people will say all kinds of things. You just don't pay attention to them. Look at the evidence. The key is the evidence. That's what Galileo Galilei taught us. And by the way, I was uh, a speaker at uh, Pisa. The, uh, at the, uh, Normale di Pisa. Yeah, it, um, um, I still have it. At, uh, it was called Cathedra Galileana uh, after Galileo. Uh, at, um, uh, and, and gave a set of lectures there. And I very much feel connected to, to the person because he brought us this important message that we should be guided by evidence. That's the way modern science is supposed to be. Now, the strange thing is how come scientists have a problem with that? <laughs> if they are practicing science, they call themselves scientists, and, but they are not guided by evidence. They are guided by trying to demonstrate that they are smart. That's the, in the context of theoretical physics, uh, uh, you know, engaged in string theory where there is no contact with experiments or data. And then colleagues in astronomy refuse to discuss something that takes them out of their comfort zone because it doesn't look like anything they've seen before. And my, co my colleague, uh, one that worked on rocks in the solar system, when a, a seminar at Harvard finished about Oumuamua, said, Oumuamua is so weird, I wish it never existed. And to me, that's exactly the opposite reaction to what a scientist should have, which should is, exciting. that's exciting. Let's try and find why it looks different and we will learn something new. So, you know, evidence allows you to learn something new. And, you know, it's such a simple point that I don't understand why there is 
pushback. And moreover, on this subject, the public you know, has its heart in the right place. So the public is very excited. And I claim we can bring more money into science this way if we engage in this. We can bring more people, young people to science. And the people were, you know, the scientists were attacking me on that. And over the past week, I got $2 million. Uh, I didn't take it from the National Science Foundation. I didn't take it from any other scientific project. I got it from people excited by the vision. And I got thousands of emails since Monday when we announced it over a few days. I got thousands of emails of people being extremely excited about the project, willing to dedicate time and effort and, and money to the project, which you know, illustrates my point. I rest my case. <laughs> uh, Professor, uh, let me ask you this question, actually, because I see a paradox here, because you mentioned Galileo and name it, you know, the, your project after Galileo. But Galileo, despite the fact that he brought some scientific evidence, he spent years in jail, in jail, like house arrest. House arrest. And the, still, the theologians, uh, scientists of the time, the philosopher refused to accept that scientific evidence. So aren't you afraid that even if you find some uh, evidence, scientific evidence the, of ET uh, life, that they would not accept your finding and still censor you and, and silence you or try to? Well, they might try, but it won't work because you know we live at a different time now. And if I if, if we do uh, see a high resolution image that indicates uh, not a rock and not a, a, an aerial phenomena, but the, a, an object that has bolts and, and and looks technological, I don't think anyone would argue with that. And if anyone argues with that, you know there are lots of people that argue that they are Napoleon, okay? And then you ask them for their ID, and you see that it doesn't say Napoleon. <laughs> So there are places for such people that do not uh, accept clear evidence. Okay. Mauro, what was your relationship with, with the scientific community around your work? Did, you, did they accept your reading? Ma allora, io ho, uh, diciamo, diverse uh, persone, uh, diversi studiosi, ovviamente, relativi alla mia materia, che di fatto confermano le cose che io dico. Penso all'incontro, le cose che io dico in relazione alla Bibbia, quindi capisco bene il discorso del professore che da scienziato ovviamente deve vedere delle evidenze. Purtroppo con i testi storici e there, there soprattutto are... con i testi antichi questo è più difficile. There are a, a lot of people who work in the fields that are, you know, relative to my own, who in fact confirm an awful lot of what I'm looking at. They, they see it there as well and are willing to talk about it. On the other hand, uh, whether we're talking about uh, rather older generation or, or, or older ways of thinking for historians and even politicians, it becomes much more difficult. Penso, per esempio, al teologo Armin Kreiner, docente alla Facoltà Cattolica di Monaco di Baviera, there's a theologian, Armin Kreimer, who teaches at um, the Catholic University in, in Munich, in Germany. Il quale dice che dal punto di vista della religione cattolica non si può fare a meno di occuparsi degli alieni. <laughs> he, who says that um, the Catholic religion can cannot ignore that we have to study alien life. Perché dice che se noi accantoniamo gli alieni, dobbiamo accantonare tutto ciò che diciamo su Dio. Because if we set, if we set aliens aside, then we have to set aside everything that we say about God. Penso all'incontro che ho fatto nel 2016 con quattro teologi in contemporanea delle quattro più importanti religioni che fanno capo a questo libro, compresa quella ebraica. So in 2016, uh, I had a conference with four other theologians simultaneously, uh, some of the most important theologians of these four most important religions, uh, including the Jewish religion. E da quell'incontro durato sei ore, eh, eh, sono emerse tutta una serie di concetti che sono quelli che io esprimo nei miei libri. And out of that uh, six hours that we spent together, some of the most important concepts that I talk about in my books came out of that. Penso ai tre ingegneri aerospaziali che ho coinvolto in uno dei miei libri 
questo qui, i quali hanno scritto decine di pagine proprio a partire dalla Bibbia. So three uh, astro-engineers, in fact, that I uh, got involved in conversations with, with this particular, with this particular book, uh, based on conversations uh, founded in the Bible. Penso, per esempio, alla teologa Ellen Van Volde, di, 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 docente nei Paesi Bassi, la quale esclude che nella Bibbia ci sia la creazione. And this is a particular um, academic from the, the, the Netherlands who, even in the, in the recounting of the Bible, excludes the very concept of creation. E penso al professor Mark Smith, del seminario teologico di Princeton, il quale ha fatto una ricostruzione nella quale, nella ricostruzione ovviamente della religione biblica, nella quale io mi riconosco totalmente. Uh, I'm also thinking of Professor Mark Smith of Princeton uh, Theological Seminary, and in his writings I find myself completely comfortable and of one accord. Penso alla paleogenetica, alla paleoantropologia, che ci stanno dando delle informazioni relative ad esempio alla, alla formazione di quelli che noi, per noi oggi sono normali, gli alimenti, cioè cereali o animali. I'm thinking of uh, paleogenetic studies and paleoanthropological studies that are bringing new light to our understanding of things that were what we ate in earlier times, the development of cereals, for example la cui origine loro stessi scrivono non è facilmente spiegabile in termini di semplici mutazioni genetiche naturali. In fact, the genesis of such things, even they say, is not at all easy to explain in simple terms of genetic mutation. Ma che è avvenuta proprio là e proprio nei periodi in cui ci dicono i testi antichi essere avvenuti quei fenomeni. Uh, interestingly, they arrived when and where exactly where these, these ancient texts tell us they did. Penso al professor Barry Downing, che è pastore, tra l'altro, uh, quindi uomo di chiesa, non cattolico, ovviamente, il quale dice che la religione mosaica è il frutto di un incontro con individui che viaggiavano su mezzi volanti, con individui intelligenti che viaggiavano su mezzi volanti. I'm thinking of Barry Downing, who in fact is also a pastor, so a man of the cloth, who talks about uh, these individuals in the ancient Hebrew texts who talk about meeting people on flying objects. Mi rendo conto che continua a mancare la cosiddetta smoking gun, cioè la pistola fumante, di cui la scienza ha bisogno. I realize that we're missing this sort of so-called smoking gun, the, the, the clear evidence. Però se non si apre una via di ricerca, di sicuro non la si troverà mai. However, if we don't open some way of research, if we don't open a path for questioning, we're never going to find anything. Mi fermo qui. This is why we are all excited about this Galileo's project, uh, because all, all, hopefully it will bring uh, some answers to our questions. I Professor? Should, uh, uh, Davide, I should say yes. one that uh, I approach this problem uh, in a very complementary way to the way Mauro described. Um, I approach it like a kid. Uh, when you tell a kid what the truth is, the kid says, I don't want to listen to you. I will find it out myself. So the kid goes out to the world, gets bruised, sometimes makes the wrong uh, moves, but learns something new. And sometimes the kid learns something the adult doesn't know. And, uh, you know, science for me is the privilege of being able to maintain my childhood curiosity, meaning there were all these reports in the past. I don't want to look at classified information whatsoever that the government has, because that will uh, limit my freedom. I don't want to look at eyewitness testimonies from 50 years ago. Believe me, I get a lot of text messages on my cell phone from people that saw things. I don't want to look at ancient texts. All I want is to uh, collect new evidence. So science is about reproducible results. So I want to use instruments that are state of the art. We now have 
telescopes and instruments that are far better than we had before and collect evidence that will show without a doubt that there is something unusual going on, okay? And that's what drives me, like a kid. So I was asked by, uh, you know, the Harvard Gazette, which is the Pravda of Harvard University, what is the one thing I would like to change about my colleagues or about the world? And I said, the one thing I would like to change about my colleagues is I would like them to behave more like kids. They should not pretend that we know more than we actually know. Professor, is it possible to, you already said that the government is not going to be involved in this because you want to keep your hands free. Uh, so you are supported by, by private donations. Uh, that is my understanding. So is it possible to participate and how? Yes. Um, well, first, if um, uh, anyone, uh, I, I should say the, the current funding allows us to buy of all the 10 telescope systems. That's not enough, we need a factor of 10 more. I mean, we will be able to demonstrate that we get interesting data, but if we wanted to do a comprehensive study, we need at least uh, 100 telescopes uh, distributed throughout the world based on estimates that we've made. And uh, so we need 10 times more funding, more than $10 million or, or so. And um, if anyone is interested in contributing, if the contribution is more than 50,000, then um, just send me an email and I can guide the person uh, how to proceed. But if it's a, a matter of crowdfunding where people have small donations, we're trying to establish a mechanism for that right now because I was approached by a lot of people that are willing to make uh, small donations and they may add, add up to something quite big actually. And we are establishing that mechanism. So hopefully within a week or two, we will have that uh, available. Awesome. Mauro, uh, what did we learn from this conversation today? I'll let you uh, conclude this hour chat of us. Per concludere? Sì. Per concludere, io direi che da ciò che ho ascoltato dal professore, quindi dalla voce ufficiale della scienza, io ho questo e mi piace concludere con quello che c'è scritto qui dove c'è scritto che il professor Lerp ci chiede di pensare in grande e di accettare ciò che è, almeno apparentemente, inaccettabile. Ed è ciò che io cerco di fare da dieci anni, almeno da quando faccio questa attività pubblica, perché ritengo che questa sia la via attraverso la quale si possono trovare verità nuove. That what I've tried to do uh, for all this time, I'm going to conclude with the words of Professor Loeb, think big and accept the unacceptable. Uh, that's what I've been trying to do for, with, with my work. And I think that this is exactly the way forward to creating new ways of questioning and finding new truths. And Davide, can I add an anecdote? Yes, of course, Professor. Um, so. Um... Uh, there was um, about a couple of months ago um, a, an orthodox Jewish magazine in New York City called Ami decided to uh, describe my book uh, on a cover story. So they had a cover story and a colleague of mine named uh, Stefan uh, Green, Greenblatt uh, that works on Shakespeare. Uh, he's a very distinguished scholar. He sent me an email after seeing that and said, it looks like the orthodox are more open-minded to your ideas than your colleagues. Sometimes we find unexpected uh, allies. <laughs> me okay. too, me too, me too. <laughs> so Mauro, you, you have the same experience. Uh, <laughs> Professor Loeb, uh, Mauro Biglino, thank you, thank you very much for your time. I, as usual, I would like to finish uh, with a quote uh, from, from uh, one of you, I cannot, um, actually, I was about to quote what you just said before, Professor Loeb, about kids. So you just said it, uh, and I can move to Mauro's quote. I claim the right to read the Bible literally and to value what the ancient authors literally wrote. So I encourage everyone to uh, always keep an open mind um, and to and also I include in the description here under the video the links to Professor Loeb's books and projects and uh, Mauro Bellino's books. Um, thank you very much for listening. Uh, please like, share and subscribe uh, and to the next. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to you all so much. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Thank you.